morning, everybody. Thank you, Professor Han, for that introduction. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me because I am getting over a cold. And uh, if I sound a little bit weak in the voice, that's why. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be presenting my paper um, that is going to be published in the U University of Detroit Mercy um, Law Review uh, in the next few months. <clears throat> it's entitled Growing in the D. Revising Current Laws to Promote a Model of Sustainable City Agriculture. And just by way of introduction, um, I did acquire an interest in urban agriculture when I was a master's student at Wayne State University. It sort of grew out of an interest in skeletal biology and the role that nutrition plays in prehistoric populations. Somehow it morphed into an interest in um, nutrition in contemporary populations, especially in urbanized settings. One day I found myself in August of 2006 on a bus with the Detroit Agricultural Network taking an urban garden tour in the city of Detroit. And I found it to be such an awe-inspiring experience that I decided to research the issue further and then decided to come to law school. And thankfully I had Professor Han who was able to help me to spin my interest in urban agriculture into more of a legal discourse, hence my publication in an upcoming law review. Right. So as an introduction, there are many terms that you use to describe urban agricultural pursuits. Urban farms, urban gardens, um, community gardens, all these different terms. But basically what we mean when we're discussing these is a place where urban residents grow food, flowers, greenery on public land or privately held lots that they may or may not own. Uh, urban agriculture is increasingly ubiquitous in American cities, and we see that in Detroit as well. It's a way of providing local food as well as to build our communities. However, despite the positive um, implications of urban agriculture, it does face certain challenges and conflicts. Specifically, what I like to focus on is this relationship in the idea of urban land and rural land and the appropriate pursuits that you would try to achieve in an urban setting versus a rural setting. And this can also often cause an inherent tension between these pursuits. This is something that the law can definitely address. So um, we can face these legal challenges in a positive way. There is a strong public policy rationale for urban agriculture. First, it promotes food security um, and provides local food. It also can help to stave off disaster. In the United States, much of our food comes from long distance um, food exports from different countries and much of our food travels thousands of miles before it actually reaches our plates. Imagine a situation where there's some sort of a disaster or a terrorist attack and all of our food supply lines are cut off. If we don't have local food production, we're gonna be in a little bit of trouble. Secondly, we don't need some sort of terrible event to cause food insecurity. And what studies have shown is that American populations actually already experience quite a bit of food insecurity. <clears throat> and specifically in Detroit, which is faced by so many economic problems, especially in contemporary times, we do need to find a way to address this food insecurity problem. One of the second ways that urban agriculture can really help our cities is to build social capital. It fosters a sense of community within our cities, and you can see that by neighbors working with each other and talking to each other, instead of everybody being complete strangers, they're coming together for a common goal. And this really serves to strengthen our communities. <clears throat> a third thing that urban agriculture does is to improve the urban environment, specifically to eliminate blight, where you see vacant lands that are littered with garbage and things like that, which also serve to promote crime. So when we have an urban garden, we are beautifying space, we're bringing people into it, and we're creating a little bit of safety within our cities. Now, we do need to balance our urban agricultural pursuits with traditional ideas of urban living. So we need to still provide housing for people. We need to create commercial success and build industry within our cities. And we need to maintain kind of this urban persona that people expect when they come to a city like Detroit. But I think that we can balance the urban agricultural interests with our traditional urban interests as well. So 
So why should Detroit be so interested in urban agriculture? And specifically, why should it be growing the way we see it right now? Detroit is a great city. We have a lot to offer socially, culturally, educationally, intellectually, and in, in an industrial sense as well. However, we do also have a lot of socioeconomic issues. We see that in the economic downturn, foreclosures, joblessness, and also in our chronic health issues that we see in a lot of urban populations in Detroit, such as obesity and malnutrition, which kind of go hand in hand. We also see a lot of blight and crime. In Detroit, there are around 1,300 urban gardens right now. And these are everything from churches to neighborhood groups to schools. However, there are also, also calls for more large-scale agricultural pursuits, like the Hans Farm proposal. Right now, the greening of Detroit largely uh, coordinates the program. And you can see a lot of the results of this urban agriculture through the Grown in Detroit products, which you would find at Eastern Market if you go there on a Wednesday or a Saturday. In the future, what I see is that urban agriculture will continue to grow in Detroit. I think there's a lot of grassroots, grassroots support from it, and it's getting a lot more notoriety from our local government. And also this possibility for profitable pursuits is also bringing a lot of attention to the movement. There are several elements that we kind of need to tie together in order to have a successful agricultural venture. First and obviously is financial resources. Money makes the world go round, and we need it for everything, including urban agriculture. Additionally, we need talent. We need scientists to go out and test the soil. We need educators to help people learn how to grow food. We need the organizers to bring it all together, and we also need people in our communities planting seeds and taking care of the plants. In addition, we need a strong infrastructure to provide support for urban agriculture, so everything from land available to grow food on, to roads and places to sell products, like Eastern Market. However, one of the things that I find that is extremely lacking that I like to focus on is that um, we don't have a lot of support from our local government. Specifically, we don't have law ordinances right now that will allow urban agriculture in Detroit. In fact, many of the agricultural pursuits that it, in a, um, which has been touched on already, is that um, growing food or animals in the city of Detroit is currently illegal. Our local ordinances do not support that. So I like to challenge our local politicians to create agriculture-friendly ordinances. All right, so let's get into the Right to Farm Act. The Right to Farm Act came about after World War II. The situation was that everybody was you know, sort of booming after the war, and a lot of people were moving from our urban areas and our cities out to more rural areas. Unfortunately, for the farmers in the rural areas, this created problems because urban residents wanted to come out and build homes and live in these rural areas, but there were already farms there. So two things happened. The first thing that happened was that there was so much demand for land in these rural areas that the farmers felt pressured to sell because they could be more profitable selling their land rather than growing crops. Secondly, when urban residents came out to the rural areas, they didn't want to have tractors and grinders and animals next to them. It was noisy, it was dusty, and it was smelly. So they brought nu nuisance suits against these farmers, which also threatened the agricultural base of our country. So in response, legislators created Right to Farm Acts. And what the Right to Farm Act does is it modifies the common law of nuisance. And when you have a prior use that is farm or agricultural, if you have a change condition, for example, people moving into a residential community next to a farm, you can no longer bring a nuisance suit against a farmer. So they protect farmers in this way. There are two types of Right to Farm Acts. The first is called a temporal Right to Farm Act, and this protects farmers from nuisance suits if the agricultural pursuit has been in effect for a certain number of years prior to the changed use. The second type gives absolute immunity to farmers where there's no liability if the agricultural activity complies with industry or environmental regulations and local zoning ordinances. 
Recently, there have been a lot of challenges to Re Right to Farm Act. Um, one of the cases that I would like to bring up is the Borman ver versus Board of Supervisors, where the Iowa Supreme Court struck down the Right to Farm Act. <clears throat> they stated that it was an unconstitutional taking because it prevented the neighbors of the farm from enjoying their property. This is um, it's the text, partial text, of the Michigan Right to Farm Act, which you can read. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, why, why is the Michigan Right to Farm Act so significant when we're talking about urban agriculture in a city like Detroit? Uh, last year, I found out about a proposed House bill, House Bill 6458 from 2010, that seeks to exempt cities like Detroit from the Michigan Right to Farm Act. And I started thinking, why is this significant? Like, why, why would you want to be exempt from a, bit, a Right to Farm Act? Because doesn't it give farmers the right to farm? So maybe that would actually be beneficial for urban agriculture. And as I found out, the Michigan Right to Farm Act should not be applied in urban agricultural settings. As case law suggests, the Michigan Right to Farm Act is extremely powerful. Since the 1999 amendment, which is the most recent incarnation of the Michigan Right to Farm Act, Michigan courts have consistently upheld the act and farmers and farmers' rights. Well, this is kind of good if you're in a rural setting because you don't want farmers to have people bringing nuisance suits against them. But it does seek to preempt any local ordinance, and there's really no way to bring any kind of nuisance suit once you can have an established agricultural pursuit. So, the problem is that if a city like Detroit was to create a local ordinance to facilitate urban agriculture, then it could be powerless to regular, regulate urban agriculture because the Right to Farm Act is so powerful and will preempt a local ordinance that seeks to control the agricultural pursuit. So can we apply this Michigan Right to Farm Act in an ur in ur urban context? And should we apply this in urban context? And as I already told you, the answer to the, both of these questions is no. Actually, cities should be exempt from the, the Right to Farm Act. One shining example that the literature likes to bring out is the example of CAFOs, which are confined animal feeding operations. Noisy, stinky, potentially toxic, things that you don't really want anywhere near you. The possibility of something like a CAFO Coming to the city of Detroit has made local lawmakers very reluctant to change local ordinances to allow any kind of agricultural pursuits. And that's the reason that it's still illegal. Fortunately, as we just found out in the last um, talk, was that in January 2012, the GAMPs, which are the um, regulations of different agricultural pursuits, have been changed. And now they no longer apply in cities with populations of 100,000 people or more. And where there's a zoning ordinance that has been enacted to allow for agriculture. Now cities can open their doors to agriculture and regulate agriculture in an urban friendly manner without fear of this industrial agricultural pursuit like a CAFO coming in and really destroying what we think of as the heart of urban living. Okay. What, as I suggest, however, the solution does not go far enough. It's a good start, but now our le local legislators and city council have to pick up the ball and run with it. One thing that we need to have, with, which Catherine sort of touched on, was an inventory of land, both public and private land, and make this information available to the public so that we can start to get an idea of where we can grow different crops, who wants to do it and spur local interest in these movements? Secondly, we need to find some way so we can make farming profitable. We also need to find a way so that people who are interested in growing food on public lands or private lands can lease the land and grow their food there. And secondly, or thirdly, we need to authorize the, the use of the land for a term of years, sufficient enough so that farmers want to actually come to the property and grow their food. I mean, if it was too short of a period of time, the people really wouldn't be interested in making that investment. 
So we need to make it for long enough so that people want to actually come and have a long-term farm. I think that it is possible also uh, to enact thoughtful and well-planned legislature legis legislation to facilitate farming. And that's something else that we just learned about in the last speech. <clears throat> So my vision for the future is one where we recognize the cultural, social, and economic benefits of urban agriculture, and also where we can model new local ordinances on those from other cities, such as Seattle, Washington, to embrace urban agriculture. I would also like to bring the focus on local food production into the mainstream so that we can see that it's a very positive thing, it's very beneficial for the health of our communities. And finally, we also need to provide the necessary financial and other support for agriculture. And then to conclude, I think that all of these things are possible with teamwork and some far-reaching, good-thinking people and um, local legislation and ordinances that will facilitate urban agriculture. Does anybody have questions? Um, absolutely. Um, the January 2012 revision to the GAMPs makes it such that the GAMPs do not apply if you have a population of 100,000 people or more within a city and where you also have this local ordinance that um, allows agriculture. So the implication of this is that now the city of Detroit can write its ordinances to allow agriculture and they don't have to worry so much about a GAMP that is going to, you know, say it's okay to have, you know, a hundred thousand pigs at, you know, Woodward and Jefferson or something like that, and that it would be allowed because whatever farm this is is, is complying with the GAMP. One of the things, let me skip to the back to the Right to Farm Act. You can see here that not only is a farm or farm operation not going to be a public or private nuisance. Um, it, as long as it you know, conforms to these GAMPs. Um, so you, you either need to satisfy number one or number two. And so if you satisfy the regulations of the GAMPs, then your farm is okay. It doesn't really matter you know, if it would be a nuisance under the common law because you are complying with these regulations. So that's one of the big problems. I was just, yeah, it was just a hypothetical, like if somebody under the GAMPs, if the GAMPs could still apply to Detroit, right. wanted to come and you know, have some sort of an agricultural pursuit that was very industrial like that within the city of Detroit, because it would comply with the GAMPs previously, it would be okay. But now that we're you know, excluded from the GAMPs, you can't do that. But I think it's important to point out that if it's zoned residential, that couldn't happen anyway. The GAMPs only apply if there's a pre-existing agricultural ordinance that allows that. Right, so bringing a CAPO into a community would not happen right now. No, that's correct. Was there another question? Yes. Um, why are we talking about cows and tomatoes under the same law? It's like 18 wheelers and bicycles. <laughs> would this be easier if someone were to draw a line and say perennial versus in terms of a local ordinance? It seems like the fact that we want to include bees and chickens in the same mm -hmm. set of regulations that control crops and cauliflowers. Right. Are keeping some of this smaller, easier, no brainer stuff. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I, when I was talking about the, like the local ordinances in Seattle. They're, they're really well thought out and they, you know, they do address these issues kind of like what you're talking about. So that's why I, I call for using something like that as a model because they do expressly state, you know, this is allowed and this is not allowed. And so I think that we can do that. And the model that we can sell is the pea patch. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, another comment from coming from the Detroit um, Urban Agriculture Working Group, the, you know, the future um, product that they will develop as ordinances that address 
each issue. So it's not like if you're taught, you're comparing our um, generally accepted agriculture management practices to what could happen in Detroit or in one of these cities that has 100,000 or more. And they may take some of our language if they choose to, but my experience so far and what I expect to see is that there will be, they will address beekeeping and they will address poultry and they will, it's in each, in different um, documents. Yeah, the, the GAMPs are the state, and like, what I'm calling for is a local ordinance that the city of Detroit, like the city council, would actually, you know, draft. So that we could make it unique to Detroit, satisfy our urban interest within the city of Detroit. Yes? I'm puzzled a little bit about how these two issues kind of fit together in Detroit, because on the one hand, you mentioned you've got the 1,300 gardens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a range. But then you also talk about how Detroit doesn't authorize agriculture. Correct. Its own but it also doesn't affirmatively prohibit people from having gardens or yes. marketing things for the community gardens, does it? I mean, how is it that this whole development of community gardens is happening at the same time that there appears to be this self-inflicted confusion about agriculture between uh, the cities? I, I like how you put that. Um, yes, the city of Detroit, the local ordinances do prohibit agricultural pursuits. You're not allowed to have livestock or chickens and your farm, your fences have to be a certain height and you can't grow certain kinds of vegetation. Your vegetation has to conform to a certain standard and all of these you know, prohibitions make it such that um, any kind of a, you know, like a farm or a large scale garden would be illegal. Um, but I actually a couple weeks ago came across a really interesting quote from a city council member and he said that yes, although the you know, local ordinances do prohibit agriculture, they are not going to be dragging anybody to jail for breaking them. You know, they kind of just accept it and they're not going to punish people for the violations. And as he stated, um, unfortunately, I didn't bring the quote and I can't remember who it was, that the city of Detroit really kind of does support urban agriculture because you know, they, they do understand the benefits that come from it. And so that's the reason that they're not you know, enforcing these you know, ordinance violations on people who have you know, church gardens, backyard gardens, school gardens, you know, gardens on you know, the corner in their neighborhoods that you know, everybody's working on. So, did that answer your question? Right. So is it simply an abundance of caution? Or why would the city, I mean, just reading the statute mm -hmm. and a little more got done with it, it, it seems to be the self-manufactured problem that you yeah. have Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it, it the potential for negative uh, repercussions of allowing farming within the city of Detroit um, I think comes from the strength of the um, Right to Farm Act and the fact that it has been consistently upheld by Michigan courts. Um, and also because of the um, compliance with GAMPs, I think, it, I think that it was much, much of it was a perception by local government that if they allowed urban agriculture to come to the city and legalized it and made it formal, that then they would just be opening the door for a disaster. Mm -hmm. Reasonable reading of the statute would be that there was no prior use, yeah. that it would potentially create conflicts. And I think that looking at the case law, especially since 1999, I think that they had a reason to be cautious because, I mean, it, the Right to Farm Act and farmers' rights have been so consistently upheld that I don't think it would be too far of a stretch for the Michigan courts to say, well, you know what, 
you have this person who has this you know, farm in the city of Detroit, there's no reason why we couldn't apply the Right to Farm Act, even though a, a careful reading of the statute, like you said, really means that it shouldn't be allowed in the first place. So, I mean, I think that looking at the case law, that, that it wasn't bad for them to have this perception. Yes? So we have a number of urban areas that are less than 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. Some might be considered suburban, which have large, you know, large, I want to say large, community gardens greater than a lot or two. Royal Oak being one. Mm -hmm. Pontiac is a, certainly an urban area, well less than 100,000. Do, do you know what the move, live 100,000 is the uh, population limit for the exemption from grants, or is there a move to change that? I and don't know. Urban agriculture goes on in urban areas, mm -hmm. and there aren't many urban areas in this state of over 100,000. Right, I don't know why they came up with the number of 100,000. But maybe people from the Department of Agriculture can tell us. We originally looked at a 35,000 uh, figure, which took it down to the Battle Creek, was the last city with the different number of areas, the large number of cities qualified. Uh, there's seven that are over 100,000, and I think the, uh, the decision, at least on the part of the Commission of Agriculture, was to, it's easier to expand rather than contract the concept. Let's start with 100,000. Mm -hmm. Seems very hot. Just one other observation is I think you know, this right to farm act it is important, but the other thing that really happens in the cities, and I think you could probably within a mile of you find an example, is that there's a lot of private conclusions to agriculture. You know, typically, somebody do a subdivision, and the first thing they'd say is, this is where houses are, no pigs and chickens, and maybe tomato plants. So the separate problem that eventually come up, I hope it's a problem of success, is that urban agriculture really blossoms. But then the people are going to say, well, maybe that right to farm act, so what? But it says you can't keep bees here in the private restrictions that everyone probably ignored for decades. So there, there's a separate little problem that's probably once we get this solved, and then you know, a little success comes, there's going to be issues that people start reading these deed restrictions that they've all ignored because they're live there. People start creeping back in and they're going to say, my kid, that's going to die beat. Uh, so I, I mean, there's a separate way of, you know, these private restrictions that are about that need to be dealt with. It. You know, my very limited experience with private restrictions is they're not easily amended. I mean, it's much easier to change a law in the legislature than private recorded restrictions because a lot of them don't contemplate changing out. The first case that was decided on about precisely that situation. A guy was raising corn and then set up a grain dryer and he was, the court threw it out, the, the, the nuisance suit out based on the right to farm act, but then enjoying his activities based upon, because there was a residential restriction on the five acre property he was operating on. Yes, but I just want to mention to my understanding, um, working with the urban agriculture work group, there will be a process where you have to receive a permit in order to operate the urban farm, and they will only be allowed in areas that the zoning has to change for urban farming. And I think all that will be looked at when deciding where it will be is referring to your question with regards to the subdivision. If it's, you know, an area that's locked, then I'm sure they will allow farming, at least especially on a lot of scale. But at least under the traditional land use law, neither zoning nor a state right to farm law would override a private restricted covenant as long as the covenant was still enforceable, either by its duration or whether it's been renewed by whatever your state of uses law is on being able to continue. The local zoning ordinance can't trump the restricted covenant because it's a, you know, it's a private promise on the part of the deed holders. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that gets into it. I don't think we do. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at that. Any questions? 
Um, do you know what the current status is of now that the um, <coughs> excuse me the right to firearm exemption has been put in place in Detroit in particular or other cities you may know of? That what's the movement as far as are they starting to look at developing their own ordinances, or is there inertia there, or are there groups trying to help cities craft? Yeah, I, I definitely think that that inertia is there. I know that you know different things that I've read in the newspaper about the Detroit City Council is that that's something that they want to do, and now we've also got support from the state of Michigan um, in writing these ordinances. So, Richard, did you have any comments? Yeah, to add to that? They're actively writing the zoning ordinance. I think we took about three months of, uh, no, four months actually to, to go over with the working group, kind of come up with some guidelines relative to how the planning staff would write the ordinance. They're in the process of writing it. Their, their hope is that uh, in the, I believe it's in the uh, late summer, early fall, they would introduce something to the planning commission uh, and as a document that would then start processing. Expect to see something.